Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today we're going to go over basic science of the bone. Here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. So first things first, do you actually know how many bones are in the adult human body? There's 206, and that's an important thing to know, especially if you want to go into orthopedic surgery. But bones can actually be classified in a couple of ways, based on anatomic location and structurally. The first type of classification is going to be an anatomic classification where we differentiate from flat bones like the pelvis, skull, mandible, clavicle, and long bones. Uh, these are pretty much the two types of bones anatomically that we're going to talk about. Now, the long bones can actually be further broken down into different parts. There's the epiphysis, which is going to be the end of the bones that form the articular surface, the metaphysis, where the bone begins to funnel and is the transition area between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, and lastly, the diaphysis itself, which is the shaft of the bone, and this region is going to contain thick cortical bone with a central canal cancellous bone. Now speaking of cortical and cancellous bone, that's a nice transition into the next topic, where we take it into a structural classification system. So looking at the macroscopic level of bone, there are going to be two main components. There's going to be cortical or compact bone, and cancellous or spongy or trabecular bone. Now cortical bone is actually going to make up 80% of your skeleton. Cortical bone is going to be on the outside and is going to have a high Young's modulus, which we will review later, but it essentially a, is a measure of stiffness, so cortical bone is going to be much stiffer than cancellous bone. It's also going to have a slower turnover rate, so there will be less remodeling potential. Looking a bit more at the microscopic level, cortical bone is also going to be made of packed osteons and Haversian systems. Next, let's look at cancellous bone. It's also called spongy or trabecular bone. This type of bone is going to have a much lower Young's modulus, making it more elastic. Cancellous bone also has a much higher turnover rate to allow remodeling according to the stress that occurs across the bone. Cancellous bone is also what is affected in osteoporosis, and there is going to be increased porosity of the bone. Lastly, we will discuss briefly the microscopic level of bone, which is going to be broken down into woven and lamellar bone. Woven bone is going to be your immature or pathologic bone. It's going to be weaker than your lamellar bone and is random and primarily made of osteocytes. Whereas lamellar bone is going to be your mature bone that's created by remodeling of your woven bone. It's stress-oriented and organized and is much less flexible than the woven bone. Bone has to be formed, and there's two main types. There's going to be intramembranous bone formation. This is bone that is formed without cartilage formation, but with mesenchymal cells that differentiate into osteoblasts and the osteoblasts are, what are going to lay down that matrix. This is the type of bone formation found in primary bone healing, which we'll go over shortly. The bones that are formed from this type of formation are flat bones, so our skulls, mandibles, pelvis, etc. The other type of bone formation is endochondral bone formation. This type of bone formation does use a cartilaginous frame that's created by chondrocytes, and the osteoblasts lay down bone on this framework, so bone is going to be replacing the cartilage. This type of bone formation is also found in secondary healing, and this bone formation is what occurs in long bone formation. So it's very important to differentiate between intramembranous and endochondral bone formation. All right, speaking of fracture healing, there's two types, primary and secondary. Going over primary first, it's very important that you understand both of these because this is a high yield topic and crucial to your understanding of why various constructs are used for certain fracture patterns and the type of healing we can expect when we use those constructs. So primary healing occurs at a fracture site when the two bony ends are nearly perfectly aligned and being compressed together so it's like a fracture never happened. When the two bony ends are smashed together, there's going to be little to no strain in the fracture site. So we like to say that we want less than 2% of strain for primary healing, so we want a construct that has absolute stability. The type of healing formation that is going to occur is intramembranous. So remember, there's not going to be a cartilage framework laid down, so this means there's going to be no callus formation. So what are some examples of this type of healing? Well, like we can see on the right here, there's compression plating and lag screws. What both of these do is going to bring both ends of the fracture so close together that the two ends will send cutting cones across the fracture site and allow the Haversian systems to remodel the bone and fill the flawed bone ends with lamellar bone. So remember, primary healing, less than 2% strain, absolute stability, 
intermembranous, in the two examples, compression plating and lag screws. Secondary healing is referring to the normal fracture healing that most people know about. There is relative stability of the fracture site, so the ends of the fracture are moving more than what occurs in primary healing, so the strain at the fracture site is higher, anywhere from 2 to 10% strain. Because there's increased strain, the body is going to do what it can to stop those bony pieces from moving, so there's going to be callus formation, which is basically like an internal splint your body creates. With the creation of this callus, the body can then start to lay down the bone on that cartilage framework. The exact stages of secondary healing is important to understand, so I'll walk through this. So there's four primary stages. First, you have inflammation. The inflammation is essentially when there's going to be hematoma formation and all those cytokines and crucial cells are going to invade the fracture site and start going to work. After a couple of weeks, there's going to be a soft primary callus that's going to be forming. Then, with endochondral bone formation, the osteoblasts are going to lay down a bone and a hard callus will form. This process takes many weeks to occur and there are many factors that go into how well the bone is going to form. But lastly, there's going to be remodeling. Remodeling is going to take that large callus that your body has formed and is going to trim it down to relatively what it was looking like before. And this process takes months and months to happen. So what are the types of fracture fixation that we can use with this? Well, there's casting, there's X-fix, and I am nailing, just to name a few. But like I said, knowing the timeline, what the four stages are, and some examples of fracture healing through secondary healing is very high yield. All right, fracture non-unions. First, there's hypertrophic. Hypertrophic non-union, this is essentially when there's inefficient immobilization of the fracture with an intact blood supply to the bone. Endochondral ossification usually fails and type 2 collagen remains. The way I like to think of this is your body will make a large amount of callus when there's a lot of movement at a fracture site. So whatever we did, there clearly wasn't enough stability, but there's a good bed, a good healthy environment, enough blood supply to make bone, and your body just made way too much of it. So this is also called an elephant foot. There's just way too much. Then there's atrophic. Atrophic nonunion is when there's not enough immobilization of the fracture and there is not a good blood supply to the bone. So your body is unable to actually make that callus formation and it becomes atrophic. Next is oligotrophic. Oligotrophic nonunion is when there's improper reduction of the fracture with displacement at the fracture site. And this is also called a horse hoof, as you can see in the drawing there. So the elephant foot and the horse hoof. And lastly, there's septic. Anything can get infected, and if there's infection in the fracture site, then it's not going to heal. Next, we'll go on to bone physiology. This is a broad topic that could be an entire lecture in itself, but I'm just gonna to touch on a few things that are important to remember as you're going through and remembering why and how these fractures are healing. So factors that are gonna promote or delay bone healing. So you need a good blood supply. Like with hypertrophic and atrophic non-unions, if you have hypertrophic, you have good blood supply. If you have no blood supply, you're going to have atrophic nonunion. Other things are like bone morphogenic protein. Your body naturally makes these, but they can also be supplemented into fracture sites that we put into certain fracture patterns. So like BMP2 will be put into acute open tibial fractures and BMP7 put into tibial nonunions. These have been shown in studies to help promote healing with those certain fracture patterns. However, if you have like diabetes or steroids or smoking, these are all things that are going to be factors that delay bone healing. Now, bone remodeling. You may remember Wolf's Law from medical school and thinking it was just a stupid thing to talk about. But this is actually very important with Wolf's Law and piezoelectric activity. With Wolf's Law, bone remodels in response to mechanical stress. So with relative stability, the more stress and strain across those fracture sites, that's how the body is actually healing. And lastly, the bone cells. So there's osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. Osteoblasts are derived from the undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. These form by bone by producing a non-mineralized matrix. Uh, Beta-catenin plays a major role in inducing cells to form osteoblasts. Osteoclasts, these come from the macrophage lineage, and these are what are going to resort bone. Osteocytes, these were former osteoblasts, which remain and maintain bone in cellular matrix. These are important in regulation of calcium and phosphate. So, articular cartilage. 
There are two types of cartilage. There's going to be fiber cartilage and hyaline cartilage. Fiber cartilage is primarily composed of type 1 collagen, and these are going to be found in your meniscus, your TFCC, and your vertebral discs. Whereas hyaline cartilage is going to be composed of type 2 collagen and found in articular cartilage of synovial joints. And this is what we're going to focus on. So what happens when articular cartilage goes bad, like in osteoarthritis? Well, a couple things to remember is that osteoarthritis is a pathological process. This is where there's going to be a decrease in the amount of proteoglycans, and there's going to actually be an increase in the water content of the cartilage. And when you're looking at radiographic findings, well, there's four primary predictable patterns that you're going to be looking for. So you're going to be looking for osteophytes, joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, and subchondral cysts. And all four of these are actually found in the radiographs seen on the right. The patient on the right actually has bilateral medial compartment arthritis with osteophyte formation, joint space narrowing. There's going to be subchondral sclerosis, primarily in the medial compartment. And there's also varus deformity. And next, we can actually classify how bad that arthritis and breakdown of the cartilage is. But this is on gross examination, which you'll see in a knee scope. So there's zero through four grading. Zero is going to be normal. One, you may see some softening when you're in the uh, knee scope. Two, superficial fissures that are going to be less than half a centimeter. Deep fissures, but there's going to be no exposed bone. And four is subchondral bone that's going to be exposed. This is a very high yield, and you definitely will be asked about this classification on rotations. Finishing some things off is just going to go over some pathological arthropathies that are going to definitely be seen on your rotations, but aren't so high yield, but definitely good to keep in the back of your mind. So rheumatoid arthritis, just remember, it's an autoimmune disorder. It's going to be targeting the synovium, and it's a chronic synovitis, and there's going to be panis formation, which leads to the joint destruction. Women, more common, and it's caused by monocytes mediating the disease effect. So what are you going to see on radiographic findings? You'll see that joint space narrowing, but now you'll actually see the bones being affected themselves. You'll see osteopenia, and also see bone and joint erosion, where it is an osteoarthritis, you won't see that erosion. You'll just see breakdown and narrowing. And in the uh, radiograph on the right, you can actually see that there's ulnar deviation of the MCP joints. There's going to be that dorsal plate. They fused the wrist joint itself because this patient was probably having debilitating pain in through their joint. And so using a dorsal plate is actually a very common treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Next, we're going to go over gout and pseudogout. So gout, just remember those monosodium urate crystal de it's a deposition uh, and negatively biopharyngeal crystals. This is going to be a common chief complaint where you'll have to go down to the ED and rule out gout versus septic arthritis. Gout, it's going to be more of a yellow cloudy appearance when you do an aspiration. You may actually see more than 50,000 white blood cell counts but the thing that's going to differentiate it is you're going to see those monosodium urate crystal deposition. And then pseudogout is calcium pyrophosphate uh, dehydrate crystals. You may see chondrocalcinosis, as you can see uh, on the radiographs on the right, where in that lateral compartment. And then these will have positive biopharyngeal crystals. Let's go over just some PIMP questions. So what kind of bone is seen in secondary healing? That's going to be your endochondral bone. What kind of bone is seen in primary healing? Intramembranous bone. Using the intramembranous now promotes what kind of healing? That's secondary. Fourth, non-union due to inefficient immobilization with an intact blood supply will lead to hypertrophic non-union. What are the three factors that inhibit bone healing? Steroids, diabetes, smoking. What happens to articular cartilage water content in osteoarthritis? It increases. And lastly, how many bones? 206. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. See you soon.